Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Wood, and to the rest of the Grand Rounds Planning Committee, um, and a special thank you to the Department of Surgery Diversity Council and Dr. Hayes Jordan for joining us this morning. Uh, we, the Department of Surgery Diversity Council, acknowledge that all of our lives and institutions exist on stolen indigenous land. So we want to draw attention this morning to and honor the ancestral homelands of those who walked here before us and those who still walk here, keeping in mind the integrity of this territory where area native peoples identify as the Duwamish, Suquamish, Snoqualmie, and Puyallup, as well as the tribes of Muckleshoot, Tulalip, and other Coast Salish peoples and their descendants. We are grateful to respectfully live and work on these lands and to follow the leadership of the ancestors who cared for and protected this land, who are native and indigenous, particularly those who are from these territories. This land acknowledgement is one small act in the ongoing process of working to be in good relationship with the land and the people of the land and ultimately toward decolonization. To support the native people of the land, I encourage you to visit realrentduwamish.org. We wanna welcome you all to this very special Grand Rounds hosted by the Diversity Council in honor of Black History Month. It just so happens that this day, February 3rd is also National Women's Physicians Day. Initially designated in 2016 to honor Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman to receive a medical degree in the United States. Admitted to medical school in 1847, Dr. Blackwell became a noted physician and social reformer. We also recognize the intersection of these identities of black history and women physicians in Rebecca Lee Crumpler, the first African-American woman to be a physician in 1864. She went on to publish the first medical text written by a black physician called a book of medical discourses dedicated to nurses and mothers. It focuses on maternal and pediatric medical care. How timely then we have the honor to welcome Dr. Andrea Hayes Jordan, becoming the first African-American female pediatric surgeon in 2000, 2004. Yes, you heard correct, 2004. While we pursue with passion and dignity the exploration of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the contributions of faculty and color to medicine are not limited to DEI work. We are scientists, trailblazers, pioneering surgeons. Don't misunderstand, the DI work is necessary and is understanding that diversity does not bring monolithic contributions to medicine. And we also exist as gifted scientists and surgeons seeking to take excellent care of patients. And no surgeon exhibits that more than Dr. Andrea Hayes Jordan. There have been challenges for Dr. Hayes Jordan along the way. When she tried to enter a training program for pediatric surgery, not a single institution accepted her. She applied three times with the same results. She has been quoted saying, you never wanna blame it on your race, but when you can't find any other explanation, that's what you're left with. I had done everything everyone was, who, had, who was accepted had done. One surgeon at a hospital replied that bringing in the first black woman was too much of a risk for his program. Dr. Hayes Jordan refused to choose another specialty and in 2000 secured a slot at the University of Toronto. Dr. Hayes Jordan is now a professor of pediatric surgery and surgical oncology at the University of North Carolina Children's Hospital. She is the surgeon in chief of the UNC Children's Hospital and the division chief of pediatric surgery. She has a basic science laboratory which focuses on rare sarcomas and also maintains clinical research efforts. She specializes in refractory and resistant tumors in children and specifically soft tissue sarcomas. She developed the first orthotopic xenograft model of metastatic Ewing sarcoma. She simultaneously conducted clinical research and completed the first cytoreductive surgery and hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy for children with sarcomatosis. She completed a phase one trial and established the safe dose of chemotherapy to be delivered in HIPEC. She has contributed to influence of the field of sarcoma and sarcomatosis by amassing the largest number of desmoplastic small round cell tumor patients at any one hospital by any one surgeon. Dr. Hayes Jordan holds a multitude of titles and accolades, including serving on the executive committee for the Children's Oncology Group Sarcoma Community for the past 10 years, a position shared by only two other pediatric surgeons in the country. She was appointed by President Donald Trump to sit on the National Cancer Advisory Board, where she would advise and assist the National Cancer Institute director on the activities of the National Cancer Program. In 2019, Dr. Hayes Jordan was honored with the by Thomas Thomas Thompson, Doxy Stanford Doxy Distinguished Professorship. The pandemic has not slowed her progress. Named to American Pediatric Surgery Association's Board of Directors and elected president of the Society of Black Academic Surgeons. 
She was also recognized by the Triangle Business Journal as one of 2020's healthcare heroes for her outstanding accomplishments as a surgeon, teacher, and leader. It is an honor to be in the presence of living Black history. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hayes Jordan as the University of Washington Diversity Council 2021 Diversity Grand Rounds Lecturer. Thank you so much, Estelle, for that wonderful introduction. It's much appreciated, and I appreciate the acknowledgement of the natives, the land we stole that you quoted. That was wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And um, Estelle, just shout out if you can't see or can't hear me well. We see and hear you perfect. OK, wonderful. OK, so. I've been spending my career working on a very rare tumor, sarcomatosis in children. And I'm gonna share that journey with you today. This is uh, a journey discovering how to treat abdominal metastasis using cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC in children. Let's see. Next slide here. I don't have any financial dis disclosures. So today we're gonna to talk about how sarcomatosis looks and presents in a child, what actually HIPEC is, I know many of you have never seen it, so the residents have never done one, and what are the outcomes and characteristics of patients with desmoplastic small round cell tumors so that you hopefully can recognize it. Most physicians and oncologists will only see one or two in their, in their lifetime, and so being able to recognize this disease is important. So what is really sarcomatosis? Well, when you have intra-abdominal metastasis, it's a very rare form of tumor dissemination. And in children, sarcomatosis is the most common. When you see these tumors on CAT scan, you often think as a physician or as a provider that the surgical resection is nearly impossible because of the extent of disease. And children are frequently offered only palliative care. There are select cases, however, in which an aggressive surgical approach is warranted. And in fact, I've done cases uh, where I've removed a couple thousand tumor nodules. Um, these are ranged from one millimeter to a few centimeters, and oftentimes they take on average of 12 to 15 hours. Once you remove all these large implants, the success rate can be variable, but I've really worked out a technique that I'll show you that uh, improves the outcome. So I did the first HIPEC in a child in 2006, and then I did a phase one safety trial um, that had to be approved, of course, because of the vulnerable population of children. I analyzed the toxicity and adjusted the protocol and then completed the phase two trial and published the long-term results in May of 2018. And I'll share all these results with you today. First, let's look at a patient. This is a five-year-old who presented with abdominal distension and discomfort for a week. The CT obtained was for suspected constipation, and the CT showed multiple masses and some ascites. The doctor that saw this child in the ED didn't know it was sarcomatosis, assumed it was carcinomatosis, and gave a very dismal prognosis. This happens to be the second patient we did on our phase one trial. And you can see here on the CT scan that there's peritoneal tumor implants on the diaphragm. Here's the right lobe of the liver. And you see multiple other tumor implants in this, this particular image. On the right side, you see some implants on the peritoneum in the right side, in addition to the ascites on the left side as well. We did a complete cytoreductive surgery in this patient, and this is the post-op CT that showed complete resolution of his disease. And presently, he's um, a sophomore at Georgetown University. This is another image of an eight-year-old who had multiple tumor implants. Um, however, in this particular patient, you, don't, you do not see ascites, you do not see the extensive peritoneal disease, and it's, again, it is sarcomatosis. You see maybe four or five implants here in this image, and when you look at the lateral image, you see a couple of larger tumors, one between the bladder and the rectum in the pouch of Douglas. And this is an important delineation because when you see a tumor in, the, in this area, in the pouch of Douglas, along with multiple other tumor metastases um, and diaphragm metastases, this is pathognomonic of DSRCT and we published that in the Journal of Radiology. This is a 13 year old male who was surfing and fell while he was surfing and thought that that was the the source of his pain. He did not have any constitutional symptoms, and I want to emphasize that it's different from 
many adult tumors. They don't have weight loss. They don't have fatigue, fatigue or nausea or vomiting. Um, and again, he obtained a CT scan. And this again looks very different, but it's the same disease. You see tumor right here on the right diaphragm that's very thick with ascites and the liver floating in the middle of the image. On the right side, you see that this also has retroperitoneal tumors as well as the ascites and intra-abdominal implants. Again, the same disease, these images are from a 22-year-old, so it does occur in adolescent and young adults. In this 22-year-old, there's no ascites, but what can often be missed is this tumor on the diaphragm. If you look very carefully, there's a light gray appearance here of tumor that's just juxtaposed to the liver. And this is very typical of this sarcomatosis disease. Again, there's tumor between the bladder and the rectum in the pouch of Douglas. And any oncologist in the room would look at this image and say that in fact, this patient would need an exoneration, including the bladder and the rectum to remove all of the disease. However, in this particular disease, the tumor infiltrates the peritoneum. And in this particular patient, I was able to remove the tumor and spare both the bladder and the rectum. And I'll show you those images in just a bit. The other thing that's important to remember about sarcomatosis is that what you see on imaging is the tip of the iceberg. This is a report from a patient of mine where the radiologist reported three or four different lesions in several places, uh, but did not appreciate the extent of the disease, not to their own fault, just to know that it's about one to two millimeter implants are really not seen very well on imaging. And in this particular patient, I went on to do his surgery and took out almost 3,000 tumors in 17 hours. So understand that the imaging is a tip of the iceberg and this is why it's so important to do uh, exploration and surgery in some of these tumors. This is a patient with the extensive omental disease and you can see these little tiny white dots that are the one or two millimeter implants in the omentum. This is the distal pancreas and the spleen. This is the other side of the distal pancreas. You see the staple line of the pancreas here and all the tumor nodules that are going into the hilum of the spleen. This is a typical appearance of the desmal classic small round cell tumor. This image we're looking into the pelvis. So the feet of the patient are at the top of your screen, the head's at the bottom of your screen. You can see the little edge of peritoneum that I've started to dissect here. This is the distal sigmoid colon and the proximal rectum. This is tumor in the pouch of Douglas. You see this edge of peritoneum here that lifts up very easily and separates from the organs beneath it. And this is a characteristic of this disease that's unique, that you're able to do a complete resection of the disease because it's not invasive and just sort of sits on top of this peritoneum. If you look very closely, you can see two other smaller implants here and several other tiny implants here. So a peritonectomy in the pelvis is required for this disease. This image, you're looking up into the right upper quadrant. It's a midline incision. The patient's head is to your right, the feet are to your left. My hand is on the liver. You're looking up at the right diaphragm. If you were to see this in an inexperienced person looking in the abdomen, you would think that this would require a diaphragm resection when in fact, this can be removed with a peritonectomy. And this is not in fact unresectable, but very resectable and resectable without having to remove any of the diaphragm. And I'll show you that shortly. These are perineal implants on this small bowel mesentery. You see the loops of jejunum and ileum here. Um, the forceps gives you an appreciation of the size of these nodules. These purplish ones here have been dissected away from the mesentery. So I've lifted up the peritoneum and I'll continue to do that for all of these nodules. And in this particular patient, I removed all the nodules from the mesentery with this technique. This is sarcomatosis and the omentum. And this particular patient you can see has no other disease in his abdomen and just has tumor in the omentum. And that is the very, very early stages of this disease, but you still see several tumor implants. This is the left blank peritoneum. At, again, the feet are to your left, the head's to your right. You can see innumerable tumor implants that are able to be removed by removing the peritoneum only. This is a patient I was showing you earlier that had the diaphragm tumor where my hand was on the liver. So again, the head of the patient's to your right, the feet are to your left. Here's the umbilicus for orientation. The retractors are on the right upper quadrant. 
I've started to dissect the peritoneum from the edge of the rectus abdominis muscle. You can see the perineum has been dissected from the edge of the rectus all the way down to the central tendon of the diaphragm. As you can see here are the tumor nodules that I identified for you earlier, and you can see that they're on just the peritoneum. And at the end of that, you're able to have one sheet of tumors with peritoneal nodules, but no diaphragm muscle involved. This is that patient I was showing you earlier that had the tumor wedged between the bladder and the rectum. If you look, this is the tumor that was removed and the rectum and the bladder are still intact. So this was the bladder side where the peritoneum was removed on the bladder. This is the, the right and the left side. And this tumor was in the pelvis on the rectum. So you can see that you, this is a very peritoneal based tumor. And for reasons that we still don't understand, the pouch of Douglas is an area where it is most infiltrative and most present. This is what the pelvic dissection looks like after I've removed a large tumor such as that. You're looking into the pelvis, the patient's feet are at the top of the screen, it's a midline incision. This is the left vas deferens, this is the right vas, and the, excuse me, this is the right ureter, the right vas is under here. These are the internal and external iliac arteries bifurcating on this side. This is the surface of the rectum, and this is the semin these are the seminal vesicles, and this Babcock clamp is on the bladder. So you can see that the whole pelvis has been cleaned out. It's, I point this out to be very specific about saying this is subtle reductive surgery and not debulking surgery. The intent of this operation is not to leave any disease behind and to remove even the small microscopic cells that are embedded in the peritoneum. So desmoplastic small round cell tumor, as all the images I've shown you have been patients with desmoplastic small round cell tumor, and it's quite a rare tumor. It, we think uh, there's a few cases a year in the United States, maybe a few dozen cases a year in the United States. The SEER database reports um, a couple hundred cases, and 90% of the patients are male, which is quite interesting. Very few patients are female, and I'll talk a little bit more about my basic science research and how that connects. And the median age is about 18 years. The youngest patient that I've had has been five years of age, but they go up into their late mid and late 20s. The presenting symptoms include some abdominal discomfort, sometimes distension when they get ascites. The survival before I started working on the disease was 15 to 30 percent, and all patients have metastasis at diagnosis. I showed you the lowest volume disease patient that just had tumor in the omentum. Most patients have tumor many more places than just the omentum. It's a pretty young tumor. It was described by a pathologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in 1989, and it has a characteristic translocation and fusion protein, which results biologically in a tumor that behaves similar to Ewing sarcoma, and it crosses between Ewing and Wilms tumor. So the chemotherapy for this disease and the radiation therapy is specific for Ewing sarcoma. We don't know much about how this fusion produces desmoplastic small round cell tumor. We basically just know there's a reciprocal translocation. It causes this fusion gene, gene of EWSWT1, but how it forms DSRCT is still in question and the subject of a significant amount of my laboratory research. We think it arises from mesothelial cells or submesothelial mesenchymal cells. There are some epithelial differentiation and peritoneal and pleural implants. We think that some of these cells are highly undifferentiated because in later stages, they can metastasize to the brain and the bone, which is, which is very rare. These tumors visually are solid and firm. They're usually multilobulated. The ones I showed you in those intraoperative photos were post chemotherapy when you see they have more of a white shiny appearance. They're usually hemorrhagic at diagnosis and they can range from one millimeter in size or less to very, very large up to 40, 50 centimeters. This is an H&E stain of these tumors at diagnosis. So these, this is tumor that was in the omentum and you can see that there's a lot of small round blue cells. But what I wanna point out is really the reason for the name of desmoplastic small round cell tumor. So here you can see there are fascicles of desmoplastic tissue wrapped around small round blue cell tumors. 
So what does that mean? That means that the small round blue cells that have most of the mitotic figures are the ones that respond to the chemotherapy and are killed by the chemotherapy and the tumor shrinks. However, these desmoplastic fascicles are what is left. And that's why the surgery is necessary because this, these cells are not dividing rapidly and are not responsive to chemotherapy and are as they are described as more plastic. And so the surgery is necessary to complete the treatment after the chemotherapy causes significant tumor reduction. I was interested to look at some of my own patients tumor microscopically, and this was a tumor from a, the omentum of one of my patients. And after chemotherapy, you can see that in this H&E stain, there's a lot of pink. So there's a lot of fascicles without any mitotic figures. And you have to look at really high power to find just a couple nests of small round blue cells. This is an interesting tumor implant. This is about two millimeters in gross size. And you can see I've taken out some peritoneum on either side of the tumor. This is very characteristic of when surgeons that do cytoreductive surgery and peritonectomies, you need to take some tissue on either side of the implant that you can visualize. And here's why. If you look in this area microscopically, you see that there are small tumors invading lateral to adjacent to the gross tumor nodules that you can see. And these microscopic cells are what are really important. And the reason that we need HIPAC is because of the microscopic cells that are left behind. This is another interesting piece of tissue. I took out a piece of peritoneum from the flank that to me, I did not see any tumors on. I did not visualize any tumors in this, in, in this piece of peritoneum. But when you look at high power, especially over here at 40X, this is adipose tissue cells, but you can see there are tumor cells in the peritoneum. And this is why the HIPAC is necessary. The hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy will penetrate the peritoneum if I've left disease behind that I can't see and will uh, be cytotoxic to these cells to a depth of about one or two millimeters. For those of you who've never seen HIPEC, this is a schematic. Every machine is a little bit different, but here is the schematic of how it works. There's a midline incision here. The patient's lying on a cooling blanket. There's chemotherapy that's infused into some sort of plastic tubing. You distend the abdomen with the heated chemotherapy. It comes out of another set of plastic tubing, reheats and recirculates for 60 to 90 minutes, depending on the tumor type. There's also a way to measure the temperature either by implanting the temperature probes in the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, et cetera, or just putting the temperature probes in the inflow and outflow catheter. But the idea is to try to maintain a stable temperature equally and diffusely across the whole abdominal cavity. So that means distending the abdomen with the fluid and gently agitating the abdominal wall for that 60 to 90 minutes. Um, I must admit that usually I'm not there for that part, so the residents are doing that, but it really uh, helps to evenly distribute the cisplatin or whatever chemo you're using so that all the surfaces that are raw that you've just dissected all the tumor off of can be infiltrated with this chemotherapy. The cooling blanket is utilized to cool the rest of the body because you only want the abdominal cavity to be 41 or 42 degrees Celsius. You don't want the brain or heart or anything else to reach that temperature for an hour, or an hour and a half. So the cooling blanket is necessary as often is uh, ice packs around the head and neck. This is how it looks in real life. This is the umbilicus. The midline incision is closed with a fine suture so it's watertight. This is the inflow catheter. This is a funnel that I used to use at MD Anderson for outflow. The cisplatin is what I chose to use for the chemotherapy and there's no local perineal toxicity, no cross resistance to other drugs. And what we do is we give sodium thiosulfate, which binds up the cisplatin molecules and excretes them into the urine and really abrogates any long-term renal effects as much as possible. The other advantage of hyperthermia is that the normal tissues can dramatically increase their blood flow up to 50 degrees and the blood flow through the cancer tissue increases to a lesser extent, what causes stasis and increases the cytotoxicity. In addition, normal organs do not have any effect of hyperthermia until you're up to 50 degrees. And since this operation is done at about 41 or 42 degrees, there is no toxicity to the normal organs. 
And we know that the heat plus the chemotherapy synergizes to kill microscopic tumor cells. Now, not every chemotherapy is synergistic with heat. So there's only selective chemotherapies that we used in HIPEC, depending on the histology. So what type of patients might need HIPEC? This is another example of a two-year-old girl who was sent to me after the mom um, insisted to meet the surgeon. The oncologist had put her on hospice care and she had tried every kind of chemotherapy and was very apologetic for calling me because she felt that the tumors were unresectable. And here's a PET scan of, of this baby. You can see there's tumor implants on the diaphragm. There's actually intraparenchymal liver implants and she had a right hepatectomy along with removing all of this disease. The only normal thing in this image is the bladder. The rest of the black spots are all disease. You can see on the CAT scan that she had a lot of tumor compressing her bowel um, and, and, a, and again, tumor between her bladder and her rectum. So we did her as the third patient on the phase one trial and we got a complete cytoreduction. Um, this is her, her PET scan after IPEC. You can see normal kidneys and bladder, but all the disease has been removed. And she's now about... 12 years out and uh, in, in high school. This is another image of a 12 year old boy who was sent to me from another country where a surgeon attempted to debulk his tumor. The tumor was about half the size when he arrived at the other surgeon, but it's sort of like pouring gasoline on a fire. If you try to debulk a tumor and you leave tumor behind, it's just gonna grow. You can see also the uh, midline incision has dehissed um, and this was actually after chemotherapy in our institution for several weeks. And this was as small as we could get it and as, mu as much as he could tolerate because he needed to be intubated because of the pressure on his diaphragm. We were faced with a patient that had a large intra-abdominal tumor, no distant metastases, no local metastases, and no chance of survival without resection. And so uh, I went ahead and did his operation. We removed this entire tumor on block. There's a piece of his midline incision because I removed the skin with the, with the tumor. we we'll see in this particular case, the case lasted a, uh, about 16 hours and I left a wound back in place and went back later to close that. This is how the pelvis looked after the dissection. So you're looking down into the pelvis, the feet are to the left, the head is to the right. This is the transected rectum. In this case, I did have to take out uh, the rectum. This is the transected left colon. This is the left ureter. This is the right ureter. You can see the outline of the external and internal iliac artery and veins on both sides, and the fact that there's complete resection of the peritoneum. Again, this is not a debulking surgery. This is a complete side of reduction. This is another child with an ovarian tumor um, that had a, an abdomen full of mucinous disease, and we did her cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC, and she went back to her village in Kenya doing very, very well and able to eat again. So how does this begin when you're doing a new operative approach? Well, you have to open a phase one trial. We registered it with NIH.gov, and for this particular group of patients, they had to be cleared by the FDA, and have, we had to have permission for holding the IND we did 10 patients initially with dose escalation as our initial safety trial that started back in 2006. And to date, I've done over 200 HIPEC procedures, but I'll share with you just the results here of the first 23 initially. And you can get a sense of how many different diagnoses we addressed in this phase one trial, because as a phase one trial, you're looking for toxicity. And so you take all comers. We had all patients that underwent cytoreductive surgery. They had HIPEC for 90 minutes at 45.5 to 41 degrees Celsius. We attempted to increase the dose to 150 milligrams per meter squared, but when we dose escalated, we ran into a number of patients that had renal failure and required dialysis. And I'll share with you those results shortly where we shut down the trial and had to address that fact because I didn't want to hurt any children by giving them a, a needing a kidney transplant or making them worse off than they were. We recorded all the toxicities and found that the operation time in this study, the median time was about nine to 15 hours. Most of the patients were followed for 
a few years. The average hospital stay in this cohort was 10 days. Remember that the younger patients are getting out of the hospital early. So the five, six, seven-year-olds are doing very, very well and leaving in seven or eight days. The teenagers and young adults stay closer to 14 days. I won't share with you today the results of the quality of life study, but I would like to let you know that when we did the parallel quality of life study with this study, we found that their quality of life was back to normal for all of them at three months and for most of them at one month after the surgery. So once they get through the surgery, get through the hospitalization, they pretty much go back to playing soccer and running track. And I got lots of pictures from them of all the fun things they were doing. The maximum tolerated dose was 100 milligrams per meter squared. The dose limiting toxicity was grade three renal failure. And as I mentioned before, several patients required dialysis. There was one subclinical decrease in hearing and two or three uh, grade three hematolog hematologic and hepatic toxicities that reversed. And one patient that was readmitted for ileus. There was no mortality. And to date, I've had no mortality in any of my HIPEC patients, no perioperative mortality at all. The dose limiting toxicity is creatinine increase. I had one patient in this study that had a cardiomyopathy. This particular patient, we took out almost two kilograms of tumor, about 1.6 kilos of tumor. And the cardiologist explained to me that this causes a release of tumor necrosis factor that can be toxic to the heart. He was able to live, but he required beta blockers uh, to manage that. And then partial bowel obstruction and readmission for that is another common complication. I've had no post-op bleedings or take back to the operating room, either in this study or since. When you go to a place to do a new operation, you want to evaluate if that really has changed how the institution manages that disease. I arrived at MD Anderson Cancer Center in 2004 and started a multidisciplinary approach to this tumor, which included HIPEC. You can see that from 1989 to 2003, the, this Kaplan-Meier curve shows about a 10% survival when we instituted the HIPEC program, as well as the perioperative care and multidisciplinary care, we were up to 50% survival. And I'll share with you, we're up higher now to 70 and 80% survival since 2010. This is what I wanna share with you we had to do to change things to make it more safe for the kids. When you're doing something new, you have to be very sensitive to the fact that if it fails, or if there's a critical event that it may never be done by any other surgeon ever again. So we stopped a trial after the two patients needed dialysis and we evaluated the 54 patients that we had done to that date with 21 different outcome measures. And I won't share with you all the details, but all the outcome measures were, were blood transfusions, how much fluid we got in the OR, what drugs they got preoperatively, what drugs they got postoperatively, anything that could affect kidney function we evaluated to see how we could change things to improve their outcome. Uh, of these patients, again, we had seven with grade three toxicity and three with grade four toxicity requiring dialysis. And what we found is on um, univariate, multivariate analysis, preoperative hydration and the delivery of sodium thiosulfate remained significant. In our initial process, there were some insurance companies that would not allow us to admit the patient the day before surgery. And what we found out was if we didn't admit them the day before and preoperatively hydrate them, that put them at much higher risk for renal failure. The sodium thiosulfate delivery, we were experimenting with and we were starting it sometimes at the end of the HIPEC when this intravenous infusion. And we realized that if once, if you waited till the end of the delivery of cisplatin, that their risk for renal failure was higher. So now we infuse the sodium thiosulfate in the middle of the high pack. So we've reduced our renal complications from 22% to 0% with many different things we've done differently, but the most important is the timing of the sodium thiosulfate, the preoperative hydration, and now we also aggressively hydrate them postoperatively, and I have not had a patient on dialysis since. These initial results are published in 2013 of the 26 patients when we had structure for the patients we were going to enroll. They had more than six months follow-up. No patient had disease outside of the abdominal cavity. They were all able to be cytoreduced to a very small amount of disease. And the 
they all receive postoperative radiation therapy. Remember, these are Ewing patients. So with microscopic disease, you receive radiation for that. The median survival in the patients that were completely cytoreduced reduced and had high PEC was 63 months as opposed to 26 months. And so with this initial cohort, we were very encouraged and of course, continue to do it. These are the results of the phase two trial that more recently published. So fast forward from that about 10 years because it took a while to get all these results. These were patients aged 22 months to 50 years. We did everybody with 90 minutes at 41 degrees and 100 milligrams per meter squared. And all operations were done by myself and one other adult surgeon, a surgeon who operated on adults. The excluded patients who did not respond or progressed on neoadjuvant chemotherapy, or they had disease outside the abdominal cavity or poor performance status, and any organ dysfunction, they were excluded, so any liver or kidney dysfunction. Also, if I looked at the CAT scan and thought that I couldn't get a complete solder reduction. Those patients were excluded. So this was a highly select group of patients. We met our accrual at 20 patients from 2012 to 2013 and had 14 patients with DSRCT, four with rhabdo and two with other tumors. All patients received neoadjuvant chemotherapy for eight to 10 cycles that was Ewing specific, cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC, whole abdominal radiation, adjuvant chemotherapy, and then surveillance. With that, the estimated one-year survival was 93% for DSRCT patients and 67% for other sarcoma patients, and the median survival for DSRCT had not been reached. Rhabdomyosarcoma, unfortunately, had the poorest outcome, and right now I'm working on a regimen for those patients that includes adding cisplatin and doxorubicin to try to improve the outcome in that subset of patients. This is the whole cohort with the overall survival in this Kaplan-Meier curve of approximately 60% over the 30 months. If you look at this, comparing the DSRCT to the other patients in the study, the black line is the DSRCT patients, or red line is everyone else. At 30 months, you see that the DSRCT overall survival is 80%, and at the other patients have also come to their disease at 15 months. This is a disease-free survival for DSRCT, and again, they relapse much sooner uh, in the patients that are not desmoplastic classic small round cell tumor. What I showed you was at 30 months, this goes out to 50 months overall survival. And you can see that this DSRCT, DSRCT patients start to drop off after that. And the reason is we don't have good chemotherapy to give them. So as a surgeon, we can only, as surgeons, we can only impact the local area that we're operating. And I've not had, I have had two patients out of the whole cohort of a couple hundred that have relapsed in the abdomen with DSRCT. And it really is the distant disease that gets them. So when they have microscopic disease and the chemotherapy is ineffective, they'll show up with lymph node metastasis usually or lung or bone metastasis later on. So we have a ways to go, which is the impetus from my laboratory research. The other thing that I wanna share with you is about a new staging system. So I, I showed you the images and how every patient had more than one tumor. And with the current AJCC staging system, all these patients would be a stage four. It's really hard to compare patients and talk to parents about outcome if we put everybody in a stage four category. So the staging system I propose has not yet been validated has patients that have stage one disease, which are limited to one site of tumor. So what I do have a handful of patients that only have disease in the omentum. And then stage two would be any amount of disease outside of the omentum and any amount of tumors in the abdominal cavity. Stage three would be liver metastasis and stage four would be metastasis and lymph nodes, lung, et cetera, outside the abdominal cavity. So this seems to make sense to me, and it does, uh, in fact, fall out statistically as well to um, be uh, important and statistically significant. So if you use this staging system, the stage one patients have a 100% overall survival. Stage two patients have 71%, stage three, 40%, and stage four, true stage four is about 30%, which, which is consistent with what the literature says. So stage three or four patients had a higher risk of death or disease recurrence. But the other important point to, that I've mentioned before is that 
if you have disease outside the abdominal cavity, probably it's not worth doing the high pack and your risk for relapse are really, is really high. Incomplete resection is the other part of it. You have to really get out every single one of those one millimeter implants. If you leave any behind, if you don't know where to look for them, then the relapse rate will be much higher. Patients with liver disease that have surgically resectable liver disease, I will go ahead and do the high pack for. However, uh, I go into it knowing that they will relapse sooner than patients who do not have liver metastasis. Now I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about the research I do to, to end out this talk. So I mentioned to you that 90% of the patients were male. That said to me that I need, that there is probably some sort of androgen sensitivity of this tumor. So in this Western blot, you can see that DSRCT cells, these are prostate cancer cells, and these are Ewing sarcoma cells. So the DSRCT, and the, and the stain is for androgen receptor. So you can see that the DSRCT and the prostate cancer cell lines both have androgen receptors, whereas the Ewing sarcoma cell line does not. And so that is consistent with what we see clinically. And so I began to wonder if there was a role for androgen receptor expression in DSRCT and using androgen receptor treatment to target DSRCT. So here's a comparison with immunohistochemistry chemistry of DSRCT and the prostate cancer cell line. And you see that both the DSRCT and the prostate cancer cell line express androgen receptor. And the, prostate cancer cell lines slightly more than the DSRCT. When you look in vitro and you add testosterone to DSRCT cells, you can cause them to grow more rapidly. If you inhibit the growth using a dihydrotestosterone inhibitor of testosterone, you see that the red line here is prostate cancer, the black line is DSRCT, and you see they are very, very similar in how they respond to inhibition of androgen. And this is the Ewing sarcoma cell line. So there's, we find that there's overlapping pathways with prostate cancer when you look at RNA on a heat seek map uh, and that castrate resistant prostate cancer is probably more similar to DSRCT than, whole, than sarcoma, other sarcomas. We've done some whole genome sequencing and I won't share all those results with you, but I will share some of the recent results that we've received after I am. Uh, show you the mouse model. So this is the orthotopic xenograft model of DSRCT where the cells are injected into the seminal vesicles of immunocompromised mice, not skin mice. And we do the peritesticular injection, we wait for a couple of weeks and then this particular drug is, uh, targets androgen receptor as, as well as being anti-antigenic. And we use that for six weeks and then looked at the results. So you can see here, this is a control mouse. These are 1 million cells. These are 2 million cells. This is the necropsy where you can see sarcomatosis. You see quite a few tumor nodules here and here. All these white dots are tumor nodules. This is a large tumor on the testicle. Um, and then you can see there's a small dot of tumor on the liver. So it very closely resembles what we see in humans. In addition, in the mouse model, you see peripancreatic tumor nodules in the lesser sac and supraclavicular lymph node metastasis. This is a recent data for single cell sequencing. And in the single cell sequencing, it's really fascinating because what I do is I'm removing the DSRCT. I hand it to my lab tech. She goes as quickly as she can across the street to dissociate the cells and then um, does single cell sequencing using RNA. And what that does is takes a lump of tumor and separates the cell types based on their characteristics. So you can see here that in this particular tumor lump, you can see macrophages and monocytes. And these are two different patients. The DSRCT cells that are blue versus the ones that are green are two different patients. And you can see there's some blue and green cells mixed with the endothelial cells, the NK cells, the neutrophils, the macrophages, and the fibroblasts. Um, here are the WT1 cells that only stain in the tumor cells, um, as well as the androgen receptor that only stains in the tumor cells. 
The only, what I wanna point out here is that this little small group of cells that stains for SOX2 are what we believe are the cancer stem cells. So if you look here, we have literally a tree of those cell types where the base of the tree are the cancer stem cells. And as, a, as you go out here, you see all the other cell, type, cell types that come from that. This heat map categorizes the genes that we found that were significantly upregulated. Um, this describes the technique of the RNA and shows how pure the RNA was. Um, I don't expect you to read all this just to understand that there are several genes that we found that out of this large cohort that are significant and that we're studying to see if they truly are the cancer stem cells and if we target them, would we be able to eliminate DSRCT? So the last thing I just want to mention quickly is about pediatric ovarian tumors. I showed you the image of that child from Kenya. And we have done cytoreductive and HIPAC in some girls with ovarian tumors. In all patients, uh, we use the, the 100 milligrams per meter squared, and they all receive neoadjuvant therapy. As the other patients, we excluded patients with disease outside the abdominal cavity and poor performance status, and uh, patients that uh, received IV cisplatin were included, as well as patients that had single kidneys. Out of 101 patients that I had done at that time, eight of them were um, ovarian of origin, and you can see the histologic diagnosis, yolk sac tumors, totally ligated, PNET, choriocarcinomas, et cetera. Age range from four to 18. Three of the patients recurred and died, but 63% of them or disease-free up to eight years after HIPEC. And this is just an image of a tumor that was in the pelvis of one of the girls. This is a summary table of the data of the, of the eight patients. You can see they range in age from three to 18. You can see the histologies here, all the previous treatment they received, the previous surgical resections, and then the HIPEC. The PCI is the perineal cancer index measures the extent of the disease, and here's the outcome. So from this, we've continued to do HIPEC on juvenile granulosa cell and some of the mixed germ cell tumors, sertoliolytic, et cetera. And we're still doing that for the girls. So this was the first report of HIPEC in pediatric ovarian tumors at the time, but now uh, people are understanding that it is quite effective, in fact, more effective than it is in ovarian carcinoma in adult women. So in conclusion, I, I want to just stress that it's possible to study rare tumors and rare disease, and surgeons can indeed effectively go from the bench to the bedside and back. And sarcomatosis can be treated with some patients obtaining uh, long-term survival, but persistence and patience are the key. So I want to thank you so much for your attention. It's been wonderful being able to share this information with you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, uh, Dr. Hayes Jordan, let me just start off by um, saying, wow, uh, that that is such an impressive clinical and research experience. I'm I'm uh, amazed by that, and it's uh, really inspiring to see. I mean, one nice thing about this being an audience of surgeons, I think all of us understand the technical mastery of accomplishing those surgeries uh, and the, the length of time and the meticulousness that that effort takes and the, the technical requirements of, of that type of cytoreductive surgery is impressive by itself, uh, much less than adding the science to it, um, uh, both the clinical and basic to make impressive, incredible improvements for these, uh, in, these kids, these uh, patients. Um, you know, as a thoracic surgeon doing mesothelioma uh, in the chest, which has fewer surfaces than the abdomen, um, I, I, I can really appreciate, uh, you know, the technical aspects of what you're doing. So, uh, thank you for that presentation. I'm, I'll start with just a simple, uh, technical question. And I, I know we're going to have other questions. I'm expecting 
I'm going to put him on the spot that Dr. Mogul is going to uh, ask some high level uh, uh, high tech question. Yeah, Harvest is ready to go. Um, you know, you've got this whole surface that you have taken off all the peritoneal implants. Uh, and um, maybe I missed it, but you must have occasional local recurrences and kind of isolated spots operations again um, to that are focal and are, are not as obviously as extensive as your first one to take out isolated recurrences? Yes, I've done that for a few cases. You're right. And it was early on in my experience. I haven't had any local recurrences lately, um, but early on in my experience, um, because you don't see all the lesions on imaging, you have to sort of know where to look. Um, and the crews of the diaphragm, they can hide in there, they can hide in the lesser sac. Um, so I, and sometimes in Morrison's pouch sort of under the liver, they can hide there. So those have been the places where I've seen some local recurrences just because I wasn't savvy enough to look for little tiny implants in those places. And I have gone back and reoperate on them. Usually, I only do that if they recur more than a year after the surgery, because if they recur sooner than that, then there's something biologically different about that disease that doesn't respond to surgery and high path. Yeah, well, I, I'm saying that out of personal reasons. I have a patient that uh, I did a similar procedure and a high pack in the, per, in the a plura uh, eight years ago that has a solitary recurrence and Dr. Mogul oh, yeah. it because we're about to operate on that patient. Good. That's Good. why I was asking that question. That's great. Thank, thank you. I see, I see her shit. I, there is. Hi, 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 Dr. Hayes Jordan. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Well, I, I want to first start out by saying to this group that I have had the distinct pleasure of meeting you so many times. And in fact, having you at MCW, the prior program that, was, uh, that I was at, uh, speaking at one of our GI symposiums. And, you know, I just want this group to know that the HIPEC community is small and Dr. Hayes Jordan is revered in our community, especially when we go to our regional meetings, which unfortunately we didn't have this year, so right, I didn't get a chance right. to see you. <laughs> right. But I can tell you she is all things DSRCT and pediatric cancers in the peritoneum, by and large, the undisputed international expert on these issues. And I'll tell you why this is important because they're, they're rare tumors a lot of us don't, even though we know what to do with them somewhat because of your research, we still don't know some of the nuanced approaches to these tumors in terms of how much chemo to give, when do you stop, can we do some more chemo, what do you do post-op, what do you do when you have a limited recurrence, all of these things. But having said that, thank you so much for joining us today. It's truly a pleasure and absolutely an honor. I had a couple of questions and I know this has probably come your way multiple, multiple times, but um, um, obviously there is no PCI threshold beyond which you say, well, this is not going to be doable because the aim is to get a complete set reduction. But do you routinely in patients with lower PCIs that have no visible or macroscopic disease in the peritoneum, do you routinely do peritonectomies in those areas or you depend on the intraperitoneal chemo to actually take care of the microscopic disease? So that's one question. And then let me, one, one more follow-up. Uh, in your, your work absolutely fascinates me in terms of the, the similarities between prostate resistant um, or castrate resistant um, prostate cancer and the DSRCT cell lines. Are you, um, are, or is there any work uh, that's coming out from your lab to sort of do some sort of um, limited phase one studies to see if the, the same chemotherapeutic regimens that are being used for prostate can potentially be applied to say unresectable or recurrent DSRCT tumors? Yes, we, uh, to answer your last question first, we are doing that preliminary research in the lab. We, we haven't gotten to clinical trials yet. I'm hoping maybe another year or so we'll be able to get it into clinical trials. Um, but it is, it is fascinating that it could work and I think it will work using prostate cancer therapies. The question about doing resection if you have a low PCI or no visible disease, what I've learned is, and, I, and I'm trying to get this paper published, I don't know if it'll get accepted, but if you, even if you don't see visible disease on imaging in the pelvis after chemotherapy, if you don't do a pelvic peritonectomy, 
there's some little small cells down there that'll start up. And I had a patient recur and die in the pelvis when I didn't do that. So now I do that in every patient. Um, so you, you definitely have to do at the very least a pelvic peritonectomy, even if you don't see any visible disease to avoid recurrence in the high pec. Thank, Thank you, you for those questions. We have a couple of other questions that just came in through the chat that I wanted to make for sure we got to. Um, the first question I wanted to pose to you is, has expert cytoreductive surgery been directly compared to surgery plus high pec in kids? Um, and the um, other question uh, is, although it's not possible to study immunologic effects of high, high pec in your xenograft mo uh, models, are you planning to study immune infiltrates in your patient's tissue pre and post treatment? Okay, as far as the immune infiltrates, um, one of the uh, papers that should be published shortly is our whole genome sequencing of DSRCT. And in that, we basically outlined that DSRCT is not an immun immunogenic tumor. We had hoped that it was, but we looked at it sort of up, down, and sideways genomically, and it just doesn't have that immunogenic characteristic. Um, and the first question was about the, what was that again? Has expert cytoreductive surgery been directly compared to surgery oh, plus high pec? Plus high pec. No, we have not had a, a prospective randomized trial, which is always the criticism. And my colleagues who don't believe in high pec think that it really is the cytoreductive surgery that's effective and that the high pec doesn't add anything. Um, having said that, I've had several patients referred to me from other institutions where they've only done the cytoreductive surgery and they've relapsed and need the HIPEC. So I think there is something with the HIPEC, but we've lost our window um, to have any amount of um, equipoise. So the, there's no way to, unfortunately, at this point to do a prospective randomized trial. And the parents come in asking for HIPEC, so there's no way to randomize them. But uh, I do believe the HIPEC adds something. Oh, I see another one about bowel obstruction. What is the incidence of bowel obstruction in this patient? So I, I, the last um, 10 years or so, I've been using Seprofilm in every single one of my patients. And that is, works great to prevent adhesions. There still is about 10, 8% or so of patients that get what I call cocooning of the bowel. So if you add radiation to high pack and some patients, it just makes this block of bowel that is impossible for them to have peristalsis in. And it's rare, but when it happens, it's, it's challenging to manage and you can operate on them and give them steroids and sometimes it gets better. I haven't quite figured out why only that small subset of patients has that issue, but for regular adhesions, we just put separate film in. Well, I recognize it's the 7.30 hour. Um, I do just want to end with one final question, if that's okay. Uh, given the significance of National Women's Physician Day and Black History Month, what advice do you have to medical students and residents that dream to be a surgeon scientist, especially as you have trailblazed multiple paths um, yourself, Dr. Hayes Jordan? What advice do I have? Well, I, I think you to pick something that you're excited about and that you're passionate about and preferably something that no one else wants to do. <laughs> um, you know, when I started doing this, all my colleagues said, oh, this is impossible. I don't know why you're bothering. These kids are going to die. And, you know, pick something that we know little about and that the outcome is either poor or this, if it's oncology, that survival is, is not optimal. And, and, and get into it um, and really dive into it. The key to success though, I have to say is mentorship. I've had some phenomenal mentors in my career. The first one being um, Dr. Claude Oregon Jr. who's uh, uh, since passed away, but he was my chair when I was a surgery resident and he's the one that really propelled my career and got me into research and molecular biology, et cetera. And, you have to have mentors along the way. And now I have several mentors because you need them for different parts of your career. And you need those mentors and sponsors or you, it's just no matter how hard you work, you won't be successful without that. This is one of the things I've learned. I see another couple of questions. I don't know if you want me to stay on or whatnot, but. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. I think um, the audience is engaged. And if you have time, I'm happy to um, continue on if that's okay with you, Dr. Wood, with um, some final questions. 
Yeah, uh, why don't we say that uh, people can step off because I know uh, people have things to do, but um, uh, if Dr. Hayes Jordan has the time, we can answer the couple of other uh, questions uh, because they're good questions. Uh, wonderful. There was a question from Dr. Dick uh, wondering what is the current trend with increasing URMs in pediatric surgery and what efforts have been made and if it has been successful? So in the American Pediatric Surgery Association, where I've uh, recently been appointed to the, or voted to the Board of Governors, we are increasing our efforts for underrepresented minorities, and we will have a strategy by the end of this academic year for how to do that. It's challenging. Um, we're tackling it also from the Society of Black Academic Surgeons side. I'm the president of that org organization currently, and we are going back to residency. We are losing a lot of underrepresented minorities in residency. They're either dropping out or being dismissed at six times a higher rate than their white counterparts. So we're developing a strategy to try to retain underrepresented minority residents and help them, give them tools for success, identify the issues that they're having on a day-to-day -day basis by we're trying to develop an, um, uh, an app on your phone that you can talk into that you can anonymously report what happens and what your challenges are. And we can try to help you um, from that side. So there are different strategies, hopefully over the next several years will be effective. Wonderful. Well, I think that's everything for this morning. We truly appreciate your time, all of your expertise and knowledge that you shared with us. For some of us who did uh, train when uh, HIPEC was a little bit more robust at UW, we uh, have fond or not so fond memories of what you said. <laughs> <laughs> a little right. different than adults, yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for your time. And we very really welcome. appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. You guys have a wonderful day. Thanks, Dr. Hayes-Jordan. Have a good day. Bye-bye.